129. Meaning is concerned with the formal constitution of an actual occasion, considered as a process of realizing an individual unity of experience. The macroscopic meaning is concerned with the givenness of the actual were 1D, considered as the stubborn fact which at once limits and provides 197 opportunity for the actual occasion. The canalization of the creative urge, exemplified in its massive reproduction of social NEXLLS, is for common sense the final illustration of the power of stubborn fact. Also in our experience, we essentially arise out of our bodies which are the stubborn facts of the immediate relevant past. We are also carried on by our I am. Mediate past of personal experience, we finish a sentence because we have begun it. The sentence may embody a new thought, never phrased before, or an old one rephrased with verbal novelty. There need be no well-worn association between the sounds of the earlier and the later words. But it remains remorselessly true, that we finish a sentence because we have begun it. We are governed by stubborn fact. It is in respect to this, stubborn fact, that the theories of modern philosophy are weakest. Philosophers have worried themselves about remote consequences, and the inductive formulations of science. They should confine attention to the rush of immediate transition. Their explanations would then be seen in their native absurdity. Chapter Verses Locke and Hume Section I 198 J. A. More Detailed Discussion of Descartes Locke, and Hume in this and in the succeeding chapter may make plain how deeply the philosophy of organism is founded on 17th century thought and how at certain critical points it diverges from that thought. We shall understand better the discussion, if we start with some analyzy tilde of the presuppositions upon which Hume's philosophy rests. These presuppositions were not original to Hume, nor have they ceased with him. They were largely accepted by Kant and are widely prevalent in modern philosophy. The philosophy of organism can be best understood by conceiving it as accepting large portions of the expositions of Hume and Kant, with the exception of these presuppositions, and of inferences directly derived from them. Hume is a writer of unrivaled clearness, and, as far as possible, it will be well to allow him to express his ideas in his own words. He writes, We may observe, that it is universally allowed by philosophers, and is besides pretty obvious of itself, that nothing is ever really present with the mind but its perceptions or impressions and ideas, and that external objects become known to us only by those perceptions they occasion. To hate, to love, to think, to feel, to see, all this is nothing but to perceive point one again. All the perceptions of the human mind resolve themselves into two distinct kinds, which I shall call impressions and ideas. The difference betwixt these consists in 199 J the degrees of force and liveliness, with which they strike upon the mind, and make their way into our thought or consciousness. Those perceptions which enter with most force and violence, we may name impressions, and, under this name, I comprehend all our sensations, passions, and emotions, as they make their first appearance in the soul. By ideas, I mean the faint images of these in thinking and reasoning, such as, for instance, are all the perceptions excited by the present discourse, excepting only those which arise from the sight and touch, and excepting the immediate pleasure or uneasiness it may occasion point to. 
One Treatise, BK, I, Part 2, Sect, B, Two Treatise, BK, I, Part 1, Sect, I, Lock and HUME, 131. The exceptions made in the above quotation are, of course, due to the fact that the perceptions arising in these accepted ways are impressions and not ideas. Hume immediately draws attention to the fact that he deserts Locke's wide use of the term idea and restores it to its more usual and narrow meaning. He divides both ideas and impressions into simple and complex. He then adds, we shall here content ourselves with establishing one general proposition, that all our simple ideas in their first appearance, are derived from simple impressions, which are correspondent to them, and which they exactly represent. Point three. When Hume passes on to complex impressions and ideas, his admirable clearness partially deserts him. He fails to distinguish sufficiently between the manner, or order, in which many symbols constitute some one complex perception, i.e., impression or idea, and eat the efficacious fact by reason of which this complex perception arises, and eat the mere multiplicity of symbols which constitute the complex perception in this definite manner. In this respect Hume's followers only differ from Hume by discarding some of that clarity which never wholly deserts him. Each one of these three notions is an essential element in his argument. He writes, 200 we may conclude with certainty, that the idea of extension is nothing but a copy of these colored T-points, and of the manner of their appearance point four also he writes, were ideas entirely loose and unconnected, chance it alone would join them, and it is impossible the same simple ideas should t fall regularly into complex ones as they commonly do without some bond of union among them, some associating quality by which one idea naturally introduces another. This uniting principle among ideas is not to be considered as an inseparable connection, for that has been already five excluded from the imagination. Nor yet are we to conclude that without it the mind cannot join two ideas, for nothing is more free than that faculty but we are only to regard it as a gentle force, which commonly prevails, and as the cause why, among other things, languages so nearly correspond to each other, nature, in a manner, pointing out to everyone those simple ideas, which are most proper to be united into a complex 1.6 as a final quotation, to illustrate Hume's employment of the third notion, we have, the idea of a substance as well as that of a mode, is nothing but a collection of simple ideas, that are united by the imagination, and have a particular name assigned them, but the difference betwixt these three treatise, BK, I, Part 1, Sect, I, Four treatise, BK, I, Part 2, Sect, 3, 5 CF, Hume's previous section, 6 Treatise, BK, I, Part 1, Sect, IV, 132, Discussions and Applications. Ideas consists in this, that the particular qualities, which form its substance, are commonly referred to an unknown something, italics humesh, in which they are supposed to inhere, or granting this fiction should not take place, are at least supposed to be closely and inseparably connected by the relations of continuity and causation. 
The effect of this is, that whatever new simple quality we discover to have the same connection with the rest, we immediately comprehend it among them, even though it did not enter into the first conception of the substance. The principle of union being regarded as the chief part of the complex 201J idea, gives entrance to whatever quality afterwards occurs, and is equally comprehended by it, as are the others, which first presented themselves. 7. In this last quotation, the phrase, principle of union, is ambiguous as between, manner, and, efficacious, reason. In either sense, it is inconsistent with the phrase, nothing but a collection, which at the beginning of the quotation settles so simply the notion of, substance. Returning to the first of this sequence of three quotations, we note that any particular manner of composition must itself be a simple idea or impression. For otherwise we require yet another manner of composition for the original manner, and so on indefinitely. Thus there is either a vicious infinity or a final simple idea. But Hume admits that there are novel compound ideas which are not copies of compound impressions. Thus he should also admit that there is a novel simple idea conveying the novel manner, which is not a copy of an impression. He has also himself drawn attention to another exception in respect to missing shades of color in a graduated color scheme. This exception cannot be restricted to color, and must be extended to sound, and smell, and to all graduations of sensations. Thus Hume's proposition, that simple ideas are all copies of simple impressions, is subject to such considerable qualifications that it cannot be taken for an ultimate philosophical principle, at least not when enunciated in Hume's unguarded fashion. Hume himself, in the passage Part 1, Sect. IV quoted above for its relevance to his doc. Trine of the Association of Ideas, says, for nothing is more free than that faculty, i.e., the imagination J. But he limits its freedom to the production of novel complex ideas, disregarding the exceptional case of missing shades. This question of imaginative freedom is obviously treated very superficially by Hume. Imagination is never very free. It does not seem to be limited to complex ideas, as asserted by 202J him, but such freedom as it has in fact seems to establish the principle of the possibility of diverse actual entities with diverse grades of imaginative freedom, some more, some less, than the instances in question. In this discussion of Hume's doctrine of imaginative freedom, two other points have been left aside. One such point is the difference B. 7 Treatise, B.K. I, Part 1, Sec. P. Italics not in addition quoted, except where noted. Asterisk. Lock in H-U-M-E. 133. Between various grades of generic abstraction, for example, scarlet, red, color, sense datum, manner of connectedness of diverse sense data. The other point is the contrast between simplicity and complexity. We may doubt whether simplicity is ever more than a relative term, having regard to some definite procedure of analysis. I hold this to be the case, and by reason of this opinion find yet another reason for discarding Hume's doctrine which would debar imagination from the free conceptual production of any type of eternal objects, such as Hume calls, simple. But, 
There is no such fact as absolute freedom. Every actual entity possesses only such freedom T as is inherent in the primary phase, given, by its standpoint of relativity to its actual universe. Freedom, givenness, potentiality, are notions which presuppose each other and limit each other. Section 2. Hume, at the end of this passage on the connectedness of ideas, places the sentence, nature, in a manner, pointing out to everyone those simple ideas, which are most proper to be united into a complex one. Hume's philosophy is occupied with the double search, first, for manners of unity, whereby many symbols become one complex impression, and secondly, for a standard of propriety by, pitch to criticize the production of ideas. Hume can find only one standard of propriety, and that is, repetition. Repetition is capable of more or less. The more often impressions are repeated, the more proper it is that ideas should copy them. Fortunately, and without any reason so far as Hume can discover, complex 203 impressions, often repeated, are also often copied by their corresponding complex ideas. Also the frequency of ideas following upon the frequency of their correlate impressions is also attended by an expectation of the repetition of the impression. Hume also believes, without any reason he can assign, that this expectation is pragmatically justified. It is this pragmatic justification, without metaphysical reason, which constitutes the propriety attaching to, repetition. This is the analysis of the course of thought involved in Hume's doctrine of the association of ideas in its relation to causation, and in Hume's final appeal to practice. It is a great mistake to attribute to Hume any disbelief in the importance of the notion of cause and effect. Throughout the treatise he steadily affirms its fundamental importance, and finally, when he cannot fit it into his metaphysics, he appeals beyond his metaphysics to an ultimate justification outside any rational systematization. This ultimate justification is practice. H. Hume writes, as our senses show us in one instance two bodies, our motions, our qualities, in certain relations of succession and contiguity, so our memory presents us only with a multitude of instances wherein we. 134. Discussions and applications. Always find like bodies, motions, our qualities, in like relations. From the mere repetition of any past impression, even to infinity, there never will arise any new original idea, such as that of a necessary connection, and the number of impressions has in this case no more effect than if we confined ourselves to one only. But though this reasoning seems just and obvious, Yet, as it would be folly to despair too soon, we shall continue the thread of our discourse, and having found, that after the discovery of the constant conjunction of any objects, we always draw an inference from one object to another, we shall now examine the nature of that inference, and of the transition from the impression to the idea. Perhaps it will appear in the end, that the necessary connection depends on the inference, instead of the in. Ferences depending on 204, the necessary connection. The only connection or relation of objects, which can lead us beyond the immediate impressions of our memory and senses, is that of cause and effect and that because it is the only one, on which we can found a just inference from one object to another. 
The idea of cause and effect is derived from experience italics humes, which informs us that such particular objects, in all past instances, have been constantly conjoined with each other, and as an object similar to one of these is supposed to be immediately present in its impression, we thence presume on the existence of one similar to its usual attendant. According to this account of things, which is, I think, in every point unquestionable, probability is founded on the presumption of a resemblance betwixt those objects of which we have had experience, and those of which we have had none, and, therefore, it is impossible. T. This presumption can arise from probability. Point A. Hume's difficulty with cousin effect is that it lies beyond the immediate impressions of our memory and senses. T. In other words, this manner of connection is not given in any impression. Thus the whole basis of the idea, its propriety, is to be traced to the repetition of impressions. At this point of his argument, Hume seems to have overlooked the difficulty that repetition stands with regard to impressions in exactly the same position as this cousin effect. Hume has confused a repetition of impressions with an impression of repetitions of impressions. In Hume's own words on another topic, part 2, sect. B for whence should it be derived? Does it arise from an impression of sensation or of reflection? Point it out distinctly to us, that we may know its nature and qualities. But if you cannot point out any such impression, Hume's italics, you may be certain you are mistaken. When you imagine you have any such idea, Hume's answer to this criticism would, of course, be 205, that he admits, memory. But the question is what is consistent with Hume's own. A treatise, B.K. I, Part 3, Sect. B. Italics not in treatise. Lock in H.U.M.E. 135 Doctrine. This is Hume's Doctrine of Memory, Part 3, Sect. B. Since therefore the memory is known, neither by the order of its complex ideas, nor t the nature of its simple ones, it follows, that the difference betwixt it and the imagination lies in its superior force and vivacity. But in part 1, sect, I, he writes, by ideas I mean the faint images of these, i.e., impressions in thinking and reasoning, and later on he expands, faint, into, degree of force and vivacity. 9 thus, purely differing in, force and vivacity, we have the order, impressions, memories, ideas. This doctrine is very unplausible, and, to speak bluntly, is in contradiction to plain fact. But, even worse, it omits the vital character of memory, namely, that it is memory. In fact the whole notion of repetition is lost in the force and vivacity doctrine. What Hume does explain is that with a number of different perceptions immediately concurrent, he sorts them out into three different classes according to force and vivacity. But the repetition character, which he ascribes to simple ideas, and which is the whole point of memory, finds no place in his explanation. Nor can it do so, without an entire recasting of his fundamental philosophic notions. Section 3. Hume's argument has become circular. In the beginning of his treatise, he lays down the general proposition that all our simple ideas in there first appearance, are derived from simple impressions. He proves this by an empirical survey. But the proposition itself employs coverly, 
so far as language is concerned the notion of repetition, which itself is not an impression. Again, later he finds necessary connection. He discards R2061 this because he can find no corresponding impression. But the original proposition was only founded on an empirical survey, so the argument for dismissal is purely circular. Further, if Hume had only attended to his own excellent part 2, section B, of the idea of existence, and of external existence, T he would have remembered that whatever we do think of, thereby in some sense, exists. Thus, having the idea of necessary connection, the only question is as to its exemplification in the connectedness of our impressions. He muddles the importance of an idea with the fact of our entertainment of the idea. We cannot even be wrong in thinking that we think of necessary connection, unless we are thinking of necessary connection. Of course, we may be very wrong in believing that the notion is important. The reasons for this examination of HLM, including quotations, quotations, Hume state that Hume states with great clearness important aspects of our experience, he that the defects in his Santa Temen T.S. or M.E. 9. This doctrine of force and vivacity, is withdrawn in the last sentence of Hume's appendix to the treatise. But the argument in the treatise is substantially built upon it. In the light of the retraction the whole, sensationalist, doc. Trying requires reconsideration. The withdrawal cannot be treated as a minor adjustment. 136. Discussions and Applications Nimply natural defects which emerge with great clearness, owing to the excellence of his presentation, and he that Hume differs from the great majority of his followers chiefly by the way in which he faces up to the problems raised by his own philosophy. The first point to notice is that Hume's philosophy is pervaded by the notion of repetition, and that memory is a particular example of this character of experience, that in some sense there is entwined in its fundamental nature the fact that it is repeating something. Here, repetition, out of experience, and there is nothing left. On the other hand, immediacy, or first-handedness, is another element in experience. Feeling over WB till the LMS repetition, and there remains the immediate, first-handed fact, which is the actual world in an immediate complex unity of feeling. There is another contrasted pair of elements in experience, clustering round the notion of time, namely, endurance, and, change. Descartes who emphasizes the notion 207 of substance also emphasizes change. Hume, who minimizes the notion of substance, similarly emphasizes change. He writes, now as time is composed of parts that are not coexistent, an unchangeable object, since it produces none but coexistent impressions, produces none that can give us the idea of time, and, consequently, that idea must be derived from a succession of changeable objects, and time in its first appearance can never be severed from such a succession.10 whereas Descartes writes, For this, i.e., the nature of time or of the duration of things, is of such a kind that its parts do not depend one upon the other, and never coexist, and from the fact that we now are, it does not follow that we shall be a moment afterwards, if some cause the same that first produced us does not continue so to produce us.
That is to say, to conserve us. And again, we shall likewise have a very good...